Joining us now is a veteran of 995 NHL games when you count postseason. I don't, why don't we count postseason? They're the most important games of them all, and right? Har- and harder to play, too. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, 584 of those with your Vancouver Canucks, the pride of Pitt Meadows. Delighted to welcome to the program Mr. Brendan Morrison here with Sakaris and Price. How are you doing, Brendan? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, fellas. How are you guys doing? You're, yeah, we're we're fantastic. We were just joking there uh, before we started recording about uh, how busy you are these days, and now you have a second career in the media spotlight. We'll get to that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We'll get to that in a minute. But first things first. I mean, it's smack dab in the middle of the postseason here. Are you watching a lot of the Stanley Cup playoffs? Yeah, I am. To be honest with you, I think as a, as well as a former player, to me this is this is the most exciting time of the year. I know the fans love it, but as a player, this is what you play for. Playoff time, playoff hockey, you know, you see everything's ramped up, you know, the sacrificing, blocking shots, just the intensity of every shift. So I enjoy it. Yeah, I I do like watching playoff hockey. The last game you played in the NHL was a playoff game. You were hired uh, by the Blackhawks at that point at the deadline to to play for that playoff run. You think back to that game, does that game have any indelible mark, even though, you know, it was uh, with a team that you didn't really have a a ton of uh, allegiance with? Yeah, I do think about playoff games often. Those are the games that uh, that kind of come to mind more more frequently than not. Like, and especially that Chicago game, we uh, we got beat by by Phoenix in that series. Mike Smith was the goaltender in Phoenix at the time. He well, played outstanding. Go. I remember I had a great chance in that game. I think it would have put us up by one in the second period, and he made a huge save on me. So yeah, I do think at times. Man, what, what would have happened if I would have just raised that puck and it went in? Would uh, would we have went on a run, or would what would have happened? So I, yeah, those things crossed my mind for sure. Based on a hundred games with the Flames, ninety four with the Flames, does that make you Flames loyal in the Battle of Alberta? In the Battle of Alberta, yes, it does. It does. You know that that wouldn't cross over between the uh, the Battle of BC and, and Alberta, but uh, yeah, for sure. In this in this series here, I be rooting for the Flames. Understandably so. Pitt Meadows, tell us how you get introduced to this game. Yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah, I, I was actually born in North Vancouver. My family moved out to Pitt Meadows when I was two. So, that's basically what I remember from my childhood is being in Pitt Meadows and growing up in a small town. And, and you know, I, I don't remember exactly the first time I was on the ice, but I know it was when I was five years old. And I, I my parents said I, I took a, a love to the game right away. And, and, um, you know, I can. I grew up in a in a in a great area to play hockey. I lived in a cul-de-sac. We had no traffic. We never had to move our nets or were never disrupted and things like that. So a big part of my childhood was was road hockey and you know a roller hockey, if you will, like the introduction of of roller blades. And and I remember, I think I was nine or ten when I got my first set of roller blades for Christmas and. I, I wore those wheels right down to the to the bearings. I, I was on them every day, and, and that's just what I did. I, I There was a passion early on. I loved doing it. I'd come home from school. If I had to get my homework done, it'd be done, and then I'd be out in the cul-de-sac with the kids in the neighborhood, and we'd play until dark until we got called in. Or playoff time, you'd watch the first period. You'd come out in between intermission. You'd play. You'd go back in, watch the second, come out with the second intermission. So now we had a great, great area. A lot of kids that enjoyed playing the game of hockey. And uh, yeah, just that's kind of where it all started. That is a that is such a Canadian cliche that you just lived out, going out to play in the intermission because you just can't get enough of it. That's unbelievable. And everybody wanted to live on a cul-de-sac. Oh, I was always oh, so player. jealous exactly. of that. No yelling car. That was fabulous. <laughs> Boy, your 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 minor hockey career was was something else. As you get to the Ridge Meadow Knights, oh, I love that we can track this stuff now. And you were probably you're probably the first generation where they were able to get pretty good uh, junior stats or minor stats. The Ridge Meadow Knights report 126 goal season, 253 point season. But in how many games? In just 77. Oh. Ah. Did it feel easy to you? Was there a point where you were just so dominant? Were you the Connor Bedard of that area <laughs> time sort of thing where just everybody knew who Brendan Morrison was? Well, I I don't know. Like, it's funny. When you're in the moment, you don't really think about these things. You just go out and play. And, 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 and uh, but I was, you know, when I look back at that now, I think, oh my geez, 77 games when I was in Bantam. Like, that's a ton of games. Like, 
you know, kids now might play, uh, you know, in, in a regular season of Bantam, maybe 35, 40 games in exhibition tournaments. But so we, we played a lot of games, but obviously that, that helped in my development. Uh, we didn't have a ton of practice time. Uh, I remember growing up, our main practice time was Monday mornings at 5 a.m. That's what it was. You know, one arena kind of servicing Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Uh, the Ridge Meadows organization. There just wasn't a lot of ice to go around. So that was the time that we took and we might have one other practice during the week and we played a lot of games. So I give a lot of credit to our managers back then that, you know, organized all that. But, you know, I, I from an early age, I always seemed to be a guy that put up numbers and, and scored a lot. And, you know, I, and I never want to say it came easy, but that's just what I did, right? That's just kind of what my job was on the team and I never thought oh going into this game I need to do this or to do that to score goals I just went out and played and that's kind of the outcome so yeah that was a special year in Bantam Uh, we had a good team we made the provincials that year that was the first time our association had ever made the provincials in Bantam and we got to go up to Fort St. John and, and compete and I think we finished fourth in the province that year but yeah that was that was a fun year and it was a year for me that I really started to get some attention as far as you know, some junior teams coming in to watch and, you know, some rumors of even some college teams coming to games. So it was kind of an exciting time in my life. You move on to the Penticton Panthers. This is pre-Penticton Vs uh, and post-Penticton Knights. Speaking of putting up numbers, a couple of guys named Hull and Ferraro went to the Knights and put up numbers. And then you're there. And of course, Paul Correa plays for the Panthers as well at one point. What made you decide to go the Penticton route And then the college hockey route, Brendan. Well, with Penticton, I I really had developed a good relationship with Gary Davidson, who is the head coach, general manager there at the time. And and Penticton had a good track record of moving guys on to to colleges and and helping them get scholarships. And and I know Korea came in or went into Penticton as a 16-year-old and as a 17-year-old, and he went to Maine. And so I went there as a 17-year-old. And, you know, my goal was to go to school. At the time, my rights were owned by the Portland Winterhawks. And, and uh, I think I was the last year, my birth year was the last year where they didn't have a draft in the WHL. So I went down to the mailbox one day when I was 15 and I had a letter there from the Portland Winterhawks. And it just said, hey, congratulations. You've been added to our 50 player protected list. And they sent me some deck holes in there. And I was like, man, this is the greatest thing ever. I got some stickers, the Portland Winterhawks. This is great. <laughs> so I didn't really know what was going on at the time, but I decided that you know, fairly early that I think I wanted to go to school. I was always on the smaller side. I felt I needed some time to mature and, and, and physically get stronger. You know, I figured if for some reason hockey didn't work out. The worst thing that would happen is I'd have a have a degree and I'd have, you know, that to fall back on and, and help me kind of get a head start on things. But even during my time in Penticton, you know, there'd be times when I would come out of the game and in the parking lot, the owner and the coach of the Portland Winterhawks would be there. And they kind of call me aside and talk to me and say, listen, yeah, yeah. Like, hey, we really, we really, and that was, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Shaw at the time owned the team and and Brent Peterson was coaching. So, you know, they would say, listen, we, you know, we we really want you to come to the team and this is where we see you fit. And we're going to give you a Cadillac package and educational package. So, you know, it was, it's exciting to be wanted, but it's also a bit confusing, but I, I was, I was pretty set on, on going to school and, and I got off to a decent start there in Penticton, and and I had my first scholarship offer. Uh, I had one offer before the early signing period, which is in November, and and that was to go to Bowling Green. Uh, I'd been talking to a couple other schools. Brown University was in very early, and a couple other schools. And then I, I didn't sign early, obviously. And then things kind of picked up Christmas time on, and then it became overwhelming. Like it was crazy. Like, every day I'd come home from school, I'd have a new, new school that called and. And as exciting as it is, it, it became uh, you know almost almost a, a burden. I felt like I was spending so much time and effort trying to get back to coaches and teams. So my parents helped me a lot. We kind of made a short list of what I was looking for in a school, and I, I ended up taking three visits. I went down to uh, University of Michigan. I went down to the University of Denver and the University of Maine. So those were kind of my final three choices. I ended up choosing Michigan, and uh, it, it was a perfect fit for me. And uh, had had a good good college career. So, what was the inspiration for the college route? Because then, still pretty novel route to take to become a professional. You see something with somebody in your family's ear saying this is a, a really good route to take. Because it was still not a well worn path at that point. No, it wasn't. 
I felt that more guys were making the transition from college into the NHL. You could slowly see a transition, even though you're right, it was it was still early. And the quickest, probably most direct path was still going to the CHL or the WHL being out west. But, um, you know, I did a lot of homework on it. When I, when I took my recruiting trips, it really cemented and solidified, this is where I want to be. I mean, the atmosphere at those games was incredible. Like when I went down to Michigan, uh, I got to, I got to witness the fab five play live. So they were all freshmen when I went down. (laughs) So I sat the third row behind the, behind their bench and they were playing. I remember like yesterday they played Notre Dame and I remember walking into Chrysler arena and like 15,000 people. And it's just insane, like crazy. And I thought, man, there's nothing like this back home. Like you just, you don't have anything to compare to it. So and again, physically, like when I played junior hockey, I went to Penticton, I think I was 152 pounds. So I knew I needed to get stronger. And, and I felt having that time in, in school and having those four years to develop would allow me to kind of get to a point where, you know, if, if I kept progressing, I might be able to make the jump. Well, and Brendan, quite frankly, those early to mid 90s, we talked so much about the Michigan team this year loaded to bear, but listen to this team. Morrison, Botterill, Turco, McCult, Madden, like there were yeah. some players there at the University of Michigan in the early to mid 90s. Really, that team was kind of trailblazing in terms of being a route to the yeah. NHL. And you were a part of that group. Yeah, we, we, we had a phenomenal group of guys over the four years that I played. Like when I came in as a freshman, our senior class, uh, Brian Wiseman was our captain, who's now the assistant coach with the Oilers. And he had a phenomenal uh, career in the minors. He led the IHL and AHL scoring a couple of times. He only had a couple game stint with the Maple Leafs, but with David Oliver, he came right out of college, played in Edmonton. He was the assistant coach in, in New York a couple of years ago. Steve Shields was our goaltender who played in Buffalo. And, and so we had a great class of guys. And, and my line mate the first year was Mike Knubel, who had a long career. And I think over the course of my four years, I think I played with 15 guys that played at least a game in the NHL. So we we had very, very good teams. We were deep. We were strong. And it just seemed like, you know, we wouldn't rebuild every year. We used to call it, we would reload every year. So uh, our coach, Red Berenson, had really built a culture there at that school. You know, Michigan obviously is known for being a fantastic academic school, but also athletically, it was it was a front runner in that regard. And then you kind of tack on the football program, basketball, and all the other sports that they had. It, w- it was a tremendous environment to be in. I've heard Marty, before we leave Michigan, I've heard Marty Turco describe the lacrosse goal. <laughs> Your vantage point from the lacrosse goal, the the guy that made it famous, Mike Legg, a teammate of yours as well. Where were you when it happened? I was on the ice. I was. We were on a power play. I always I played the point on the power play in college. So uh, I was up there and I saw kind of what was happening. And and Legger did this all the time in practice. Like sure. he, he would do it all the time. And guys are like, and I think Red said to him one day, why don't you try that in the game? And I think Mike thought he was joking, you know. And uh, <laughs> anyways, the opportunity just presented itself where there was a battle with John Madden down low. The puck got kicked to Mike Leg behind the net and he had time there. Like he wasn't being forced by, by the D-man from Minnesota. So when he did it, like we had seen it obviously in practice a ton of times, but do it in a game. It was a big game. It was a regional game. Uh, the winner of that went to the final four. We were actually down in that game. I think at the time it was two, one. So he pulls that off. And at first it was like, did that really happen? And then if you watch the highlight videos, I think I'm the first guy in there and just jump on him in the corner. So that, that really gave our team a huge boost, like just kind of gave us confidence. And then we ended up winning that, winning that game and, and going on into the, uh, into the final four and actually winning the national championship that year. But yeah, that was a huge moment for our team in that game. And uh, when you obviously look at we are, where we are today in the game of hockey and you look, kind of look back at that in 1996, I mean, it's really changed the game today. I mean, it, these young kids, almost all of them can do it. It's phenomenal. Wow, Mike Legg and Red Barons, an old school Red, yeah. a quarter century ahead of their time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that and well, isn't it great goal. to hear the Red encouraged, that encouraged it? it. That's yeah. unbelievable. That's, yeah. that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, you would control. never think that would happen, but you know, yeah, he was. You know, as old school as he was, he was progressive, right? And he wanted us to showcase our, our talents, and you know, he, he really preached us playing good defensive hockey, but he never hamstrung us offensively. He said, "That's when you guys." can use your creativity and and as long as you're playing well defensively go go at her (laughs) 
You're a second round pick, 39th overall to the Devils. What do you remember about being drafted? Yeah, it was it was it was an exciting time. So that happened prior to me going to Michigan. I was in with with the Panthers still, and kind of the second half of that year is when you know rankings start to come out, and and you don't really know where you stand, and then you start seeing things like, man, like I might have a chance here to get drafted. And then I remember the big thing for me was when Bob McKenzie. You know, he came out with his his prospect list, and he always kind of ranks the top two rounds, right? Like fifty two draft picks, and he had me pegged at thirty ninth, um, and that's exactly where I ended up going, the thirty ninth. But I remember uh, it, it became real kind of when my season ended in Penticton, and teams would reach out to me, and I I did probably ten or eleven um, interviews with with NHL teams where you know they'd meet you, sit down, kind of have a one on one. You know, basically, just picking your brain, almost like a analyzing you, uh, psychoanalyzing you with a bunch of these questions. I remember some of these things. I'd go in there, and they would have like these abstract pictures of art on like sheets, and they'd ask me, "So, what do you what do you see in this picture?" <laughs> like, what? It was bizarre, it's man. Like, like NFL combine. Yeah, stuff. yeah. It was bizarre. I mean, the best one I had though was with Sean Deneen. At the time, he was with, I believe, he was with the Blackhawks. No, he was with the Bruins at the time. Sean Deneen living in Penticton and uh he actually took me out fly fishing that was the first time I had ever fly fished and so he said hey I know you like fishing and you want to you know well, let's go fly fishing for the day so we kind of drove around all these back roads in the Okanagan and we fly fish for the day and that's how how he conducted his interview which was pretty cool but with the Devils they actually uh, they flew me out to Toronto uh went to a Blue Jays game and they had uh, four or five other guys I, I remember Jamie Lagenbrunner was there Oh, I can't remember the other guys, but they actually put us through some physical testing. So we went out there. They made us do like pull ups. They made us. They made us get on a treadmill and do like a stress test. So I thought this is a little bit different than all the other teams. So, anyways, they ended up drafting me, and and I went to the draft. It was in Quebec City, and that was bizarre too because that was the year that Alexander Dag went number one, and the Senators had come out and already you know publicly stated we're taking him number one. So I remember going walking to the draft with my dad. And Alexander Digg was riding to the draft by horse and carriage, and Jean Beliveau was beside him in the front of the carriage. Oh my so goodness. it was this huge to do, right? A Quebec kid going number one overall at the draft in Quebec City. It was it was crazy. I would have thought the motor vehicle would have made it to Quebec by then, but apparently, yes, not. no, <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly. crazy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Brendan, that Devils organization at the time, and uh, you mentioned the the amateur side, David Conte, of course, uh, legendary. Mm -hmm. But boy, did they develop players! I mean, you get to Albany and into that system, and that might just have been the best draft and develop system at the time. Yeah, they did. The a, they did a great did job for you. Yeah, so they had you did mention Dave Conte and Marshall Johnson was there as well, and and their their scout in in the interior there was Glenn Dirk. And he played, he lived in Vernon. So he saw me a lot playing um, when I was in Penticton. But yeah, you you look at historically that kind of era and their, their draftees and, you know, a lot of guys that were in their system and then even moved on from their system and really excelled afterwards. They, they were, I mean, you know, they, they were the best of the best at the time, I think, at evaluating talent and, and just being able to find guys that would fit for what they were looking for, right? Uh, but it was deep. I remember going into my first training camp you know, very nervous. You, know, you walk into the locker room and, and immediately you're playing and essentially competing with guys that you've watched on TV your whole life. Like, you know, Scott Niedermeyer, Scott Stevens, Doug Gilmore, Dave Anderchuk, Marty Brodeur, Ken Danico. It's like Bobby Holik. It's all these Hall of Fame guys. And you're like, it took me a while to kind of get used to it, you know, to make me make convince myself that I belong there. And uh, yeah, we had great teams. It was a good organization to learn from. You know, I I might have been a little, little impatient with with how I was developing there. Um, in hindsight, you know, I did go to the minors and for almost an entire year, which I think was good for me. Kind of learned how the pro game kind of worked. Uh, you know, obviously the volume of games is much more. Um, just how to be a good pro and preparation and things like that. But you know, and then you got called up to the big club a couple times. My my first year pro, and the next year I was I was a rookie full time and. But we had a deep team. Like I would, you know, I would play on the top line power play with Niedermeyer, Arnott, Sakura, Elias. Then I'd play the fourth line with like Christoph Olua, Sasha Lakovic. So I think I got a little bit frustrated that, you know, I, I guys that I played against in college that were maybe free agents 
signed with other teams because that you know when you're a free agent you can sign with anybody obviously and I saw them kind of you know getting opportunities that might have been more than what I was getting so I was a little frustrated early on at times but hey I learned a lot from New Jersey I mean Lou he runs a tight ship but I think anybody that's ever played for him appreciates and respects you know how you learn to be a professional. Now you get traded to the Canucks mid-season 99-2000 I see Willie Mitchell dipped his toe into that devil's room in that season. Did you cross it? Is that when you first met Willie or was he there after you had left to, to the Canucks? So the inter- interesting story with Willie is the first time I ever met him, I was in Albany and my roommate at the time was a guy by the name of Rob Skurlak. He was kind of our, our tough guy. And S- Rob grew up with Willie in, in, uh, up in Port McNeil. So at the time, my first year pro, Willie was actually playing at Clarkson University. So Rob says to me, hey, I got a buddy who's going to school at Clarkson not too far from here. I, he's not going to go home for Christmas. Do you mind if he just comes and, and sleeps on our couch at Christmas? I'm like, yeah, no problem. I don't care. <laughs> so it uh, turns out it was Willie. <laughs> like, so that's the first time I met him. He was buddies with Rob. So he slept at, slept on our couch there at Christmas time. But oh. so I never actually, I, Willie and I never actually played together on the Devils. He came in kind of after I was traded. Mm-hmm. I, that's wow. unbelievable. And then the friendship persists to this very day where you guys are fishing in retirement. It's yeah. unbelievable. And just before we move on to the Canucks, you get called up because John McLean requests a trade. And like you do that with Lou, you ain't playing, right? So McLean gets shuffled aside. You get called up. You score in your first game against Tom Barrasso, who I'm sure muttered a thing or two. Oh, it was, uh, it, absolutely. Story. It was crazy. Well, yeah, you're right. John McClain was Mr. Devil, right? He was there 18 years, uh, the longest tenure devil. I was actually in Albany. I was in my apartment and I got a phone call and it was Lou. And he said, uh, you know, Brendan, uh, we want you to get in your vehicle, drive down to New Jersey tonight. You're playing tomorrow night in Pittsburgh. I'm like, what? Okay. So I, I grabbed my gear. Uh, I drive down to the hotel. So I meet Lou in the morning in the lobby and this is classic. So the team's already traveled because this is now game day. So the team always goes in the day before. So I, I'm kind of confused as to what's happening. So Lou's like, it's going to be just you and I. We're flying on Dr. McMullen's private jet into Pittsburgh, and you're going to go right to pregame skate. So you can imagine two pilots, and there's just Lou and I on this private jet. It's so awkward. Oh, my he's goodness. Going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he's the godfather, right? Like the Don. And it, I'm so nervous, so. He was good. So we land in Pittsburgh. We have a car waiting for us on the tarmac. I go straight to the igloo. And the guys were great. Like, uh, you know, you're always wondering, oh, man, like John McClain, he's the longest tenured guy. And I know the guys in the locker room love him. He's been here forever. Like, you know, how are, they gonna, how are you going to be received? But it's, it's, it's awesome. The locker room is great. Guys understand there's, you know, business part of hockey. But, you know, they, they opened their arms right away and welcomed me. And, and uh, yeah, so that night we, ended, we played. And I remember we beat Pittsburgh 4 nothing And... Uh, just as the power play kind of expired there, I, I, I got a rebound and pulled it to my backhand and scored on Barrasso. I had my first shot on net, uh, first game, first goal. So that was pretty cool. Not bad at all. You said you wanted a little more opportunity to get traded to the Canucks. You played a dozen games with them on a non-playoff year. You got nine points in 12 games. Did that make you think, okay, they're going to give me a shot here because you ended up getting that shot the very next year, your first full season you play. Gosh, you were Iron Man for for the Canucks, all eighty two games for a bunch of years in a row there. But you go from that nine point in twelve game stint after the deadline to a fifty four point season with sixteen goals. It uh, it started to come together, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Like it just kind of reinforced. I think that that finish of the year there is, you know, and we still we were real close to getting in the playoffs there. We got knocked out, I think, in game eighty one. But you know, I I knew you know Vancouver obviously brought in myself, Dennis Peterson, traded McGillney. So a big part of their offense was gone. So I was, you know, I like to think that they were going to give me an opportunity not to fill his role, but somehow contribute in an offensive role. Um, so when I finished the season there, I, you know, mentally it was a good finish. And, and going into the next year, you know, I didn't know where I was going to slot in. I had a good idea. And, and I played most of that next season with, with Peter Schaefer and Matt Cook. And we had a good year. Like our, our line, we had a really good year. And at that and we time, should point out, we should point out Andrew Castles was still there. The West Coast yeah. Express wasn't a thing. He was the he was the original was the sort of guy there. Yeah, setup man. Yeah, absolutely. And so Cass played with with Marcus and Todd, and and uh, you know I, I learned a lot from 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 Cass. You know we were similar players, how we like to distribute the puck, etc. He was a very very smart player, a very headsy player. Saw the ice extremely well. 
so I would try and you know watch him when he played with those guys to see what I could what I could learn and and uh, so that first full year I played primarily with like I said Shafe and uh, Cookie and then the next season started with those guys again and it was about halfway through the year in January where I, I was given the chance in Detroit to play with Marcus and Todd we were we went through a bit of a stretch there as a team where we were playing that great. To kind of mix things up, and and we had a had a good game that night, and they had a good second game together, and we never really looked back. We, that was kind of the, our line moving forward for the next three years. The West Coast Express is born, and you guys would end up being amongst the, if not the most prominent line in the National Hockey League, the tail end of the dead puck era. So while most teams were struggling to find offense, all of a sudden, lightning in a bottle with you three. Did you guys feel like the best line in hockey when you guys were, were clicking on all cylinders? Well, you know, I we had a lot of fun playing together. Like, challenged each other a lot. We were hard on each other. You know, if one guy wasn't playing up to but the other's expectations or his capability, the other guys would let him know. But we there were there were certain nights when we, we stepped on the ice and we expected to score every shift. And as an offensive player, when you are in that mind space if you will and you have that mentality it's an awesome place to be like it's the best you know there's certain times when you go on the ice and you think to yourself am i ever going to score again like but when you go on and you know hey there's a potential to score every time you guys have the puck it's a great great place to be in so you know we we felt comfortable about playing against anybody uh you know there's a there was a lot of good lines still i mean we, we'd battle head to head again against detroit and obviously eisman and Fedorov, and at that time in the West, you had the Colorado with Sackick and Forsberg, and there was a lot of good lines. But we felt we felt that we were as good as any line. Uh, in the case of Bertuzzi, I mean, we had seen few players like him when you combine the size, the hands, which were just magnificent, but also the look and the profile and the attitude and everything. Were there games where guys were just scared of Todd? And how much room did he open up for the for you and for Marcus on the other flank. Yeah, he, he was, at the time, he was the best power forward in the game. I mean, like you mentioned, his, his physical stature, his, his the finesse that he had, um, he was the total package, right? Like, and, and he was just a surly guy on the ice, like, you know, always kind of had the scowl on his face. And that was his persona. And, and that's what he protruded. And yeah, guys, guys didn't really want to have to deal with him on the ice and defensemen didn't like going back into the corner when you know when he was in on the four check and you know when he was when he put his mind to it and when he was determined i mean he was he could be nasty out there and then there were times when Bert would you know we don't get away from that part of his game a bit and just focus totally on the finesse which was still successful but when he played that you know bruising physical finishes check style I mean, he uh, intimidated a lot of guys and he created room. Absolutely. And uh, I think what was unique about our line is, you know, we all thought the game very similarly, but we each brought, I think, something unique to the line with Todd. We mentioned, you know, he had the finesse, he had the finish, but he also had that, that kind of nastiness in him that, you know, other, other teams had to respect. And with Marcus, he had the pure goal scoring, but also very, very underrated as a playmaker and his, his hockey sense was off the charts. And with me, you know, I brought a defensive conscience to the line, you know, and uh, I think with my speed, I created openings that way and backed the off at times. And yeah, so it, it was it was great to kind of have a combination of a bunch of different things that just seemed to work. We can debate which was the better season for the team and and yourself in particular, the 0203 or 0304. And we can get to what derailed 04 in a second, but really the best chance for you guys to advance intact as a team was 0203 we still hear fans bring up oh what could have been if you get past the minnesota wild does that still uh, echo in your head a little bit do you hearken back to to particular games you say sometimes do you hearken back to that series and think if you get past the minnesota wild as a world your oyster absolutely yeah i do it that was set up perfect for us i think that year to, to really make a run and <laughs> And even the situation we put ourselves in being up three to one, you know, it, yeah, it, it, it's, and I don't like, I don't know if regret is, is the right word, uh, but I replay scenarios in that series in my head a lot of time and always kind of have an internal debate could have happened. <laughs> I try not yep, to do it yep. because it drives me crazy, 
but to be honest, it's human nature to think about those things at times, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, it just it just wasn't meant to be. I, if we just we didn't get the job done, uh, yeah, it was. It still is frustrating to be honest with you. It, it would have been nice to see what would have happened, but that's that's uh, that's why you play the games, and and, and sometimes. <laughs> You know, maybe the favorites or the favorite teams or the better teams that don't always win. And in a similar vein, the following year, of course, a very good year for the team as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but March 8th, things change, obviously. And Todd Bertuzzi is gone for a while. Explain that crazy night, that crazy week that was for, for you guys because of the return engagement, the the two games against the Avs in, in a short spe- uh, period of time. Yeah, you know, even, even to this day, it's still kind of the whole – situation seems surreal to be honest with you like um but i remember it pretty clear like obviously in, in colorado and and uh you know in today's game you know things are called much differently but you know nazi lunges for pucks so who's in a vulnerable position more finishes his check on him you know hits him to the head leaves the game isn't feeling very good so you know <laughs> i remember the lead up to the game there was a huge buzz to it right like is there going to be retribution? And what's going to happen here? And the guy's going to go after more. Like, what's going on? And but, you know, I look back and it was the perfect storm, right? Like, I mean, if that's a close game, I don't think any of this happens. You know, right. you know, early on in that game, I know, you know, Cookie challenged more to fight, and they kind of got into a wrestling match. And you'd like to think at that point in time it was kind of done, done with, right? But as the game progressed, it got out of hand. It was almost like that mob mentality where. And, and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. Everybody is accountable and, and responsible for their own actions. But, you know, the crowd was kind of restless. They were getting on us because we were getting smoked at home by against a big rival. Yeah, it just wasn't a good situation. And, and we all know the intent was, was not to injure a player like that. And, uh, but the outcome was, was uh, you know, horrendous for everybody. I mean, really, I mean, it, it tore up. I mean, ended, ended a player's career. And, uh, you know, tore a a big piece of our team uh, apart. Well, 708 becomes your final year with the Canuck. The Ironman streak ends at 542 games. Blake, it was my second week living here as a reporter for the Globe, and I'm frantically (laughs) calling Steve Tambellini. Is he going to play tonight or not? Do we have a story? The 82 game thing on the the back of your player, uh, the back of your hockey card, the 82 games in a row, it's it's crazy to think about in today's uh, terms. uh, And amazing, too. The best stability being availability. And you had that until that season, Brendan, but it was. A litany of injuries, and you wind up signing with the Anaheim Ducks in the off season. I'm not sure it was that apparent right there at the end of the 08 season, but you tell me. Did you think something special was coming in Vancouver? Like, do you regret not being able to be here for when Hank and Danny grew up and Burr got onto that line and we saw some of the best Canucks hockey we have ever seen? Absolutely. You know, I, I firmly believe going into the 07 08 season, I was going to finish my career in Vancouver. That was that was a time time period where players were starting to sign some longer term deals, like five year deals. And I thought to come into this year, have a good season. I'm going to sign a long term deal. I'll be in Vancouver the rest of my life. And that was my goal. Well, it didn't end up that way. I, I, I got I got hit in preseason. I dislocated a tendon in my wrist. Tried to play with that for until Christmas time. And then I remember in LA, it, it came out three different times, ended up costing our team a goal. And I was like, that's it. I, I can't keep, I can't do this anymore. I got to get this fixed. So I got surgery on my wrist and uh, was out for three months, I think close to that two and a half, three months, you know, worked hard because we were right in the playoff hunt still uh, came back, played, I think seven games in Colorado was kind of driving wide on, on Carlos Graskins had all my weight on my back leg. He kind of hits me, not hard, but just I had all my weight loaded on my back foot. I kind of collapsed. My knee is on fire. I'm like, something's wrong with my knee here. Tore my ACL. (laughs) So, yeah. yeah, So, I mean, just bad luck, but it's part of the game. It's what it is. It's terrible to go through those injuries. But uh, after going so long with being pretty healthy to have back-to-back, like, long-term injuries, it, uh, it, it was tough. But the worst part was is, you know, I, I didn't get back that season. We ended up not making the playoffs. They fired Dave Nonis. 
they bring in Mike Gillis. So a tremendous amount of change and, and, and kind of adversity within a short period of time. So I remember, you know, I met with Mike Gillis face to face a couple of times. And it was apparent to me when I met with him that, you know, I felt like he was almost obligated. He felt like he was obligated to offer me a contract. So they offered me a deal, but it was nowhere close to what, you know, I, the other other deals I got in free agency. So the morning of free agency, I got a call from Berkey and Nonis because Dave had been hired after he was fired in Vancouver by Anaheim. Berkey was running the show. They just basically said, Mo, listen. We want you to come down here, be our second line center. We got Gesloff Perry as our first line. Uh, you're going to play with Solani. That's going to be your lineman. I'm like, man, go play with Tamo Solani for the year? Like, okay. So they, it's, it's interesting. I talked to a couple other teams too, like Columbus, Minnesota, a couple other teams who would offer me longer, like three-year deals. And uh, I, I basically bet on myself. I said, I'm going to sign a one-year deal because even Anaheim said, we'll sign you to a two-year deal. I said, no, one-year deal. I'm going to play with Solani. I'm going to have an awesome year. Then I'm going to sign a longer term deal. Well, my, that year was terrible. Oh my God. I, <laughs> I, the first time in my life ever, I dreaded going to the rink because oh, I just, no. I couldn't skate. Like I could skate at 80%, but a big part of my game was my skating, you know, challenging guys, my quickness, beating guys out of corners. And I couldn't do it mentally. I knew what I wanted to do, but physically I just couldn't do it. So it was tough, man. Like it was really tough. So <laughs> The, the bet on myself didn't really go according to plan. <laughs> so I had a tough year. Mm. So I ended up going to uh, to Dallas that year as, as a, as a, there was a trade in place, but it ended up getting nullified. So Anaheim's like, they had a deal. They said, okay, we'll just put them on waivers. And Dallas said, okay, we'll pick them up. So I ended up going to Dallas for 19 games and actually had a pretty good finish to the year. And then the following season signed in Washington and, 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 and felt physically way better that year. But yeah, I never wanted to leave Vancouver. And, uh, you know, even after my year in Washington, which I had a good year and we had a phenomenal team, I thought I was going to be back in Vancouver for 10, 8, 9, 9, 10, 10, 11. I skated with them. I went to training camp. I mean, we can get into that if you guys want to and get my perspective on that. But I thought I was going to be back in Vancouver. And, and what, what went wrong there? Well, I was skating with the team. Um, you know, all the guys were back in Vancouver. I was skating with the team at GM Place and at UBC. And I remember Vigneault was still coaching. He's like, Mo, what, what are you doing this year? I said, well, I'm talking to some teams, but I said, nothing's been cemented yet. I said, and he said, well, I, you know, I, I'd really like to see you back in Vancouver. And I said, okay, well, why didn't you guys sign me? He said, well, I talked to Gillis and the issue is, you know, we have 49 players under contract right now. And we're, and we're worried, um, you know, if a goaltender gets hurt in training camp, we have to use that that contract you know, to sign him to the goaltender. So he said, why don't you come to camp? And, uh, you know, he's like, I know you. I know what you can bring to the table. And I knew I was a different player from when, you know, I was kind of in my prime early on, but I still felt very versatile. Like I put up, you know, 40 something points in, in Washington. I played center. I played the wing, played the power play, killed penalties. And I felt good. I was healthy again. So I, I was like, I thought about it for about a week. They called me in again. What are you going to do? Talk to my agent. You know, and to be honest with you, it's a little bit, it hurts your pride a bit. You've been in the league for, you know, 12 years and, and now you're getting asked to come to, to camp on a trial, like a PTO. So I was a little bit disappointed they got to that, but I was like, you know what? I can make this team. So I went in and with the understanding that, you know, if I went and prove, because they told me, we want to make sure your knee is healthy. I'm like, well, I just played the whole year. I just played 76 games. There's nothing wrong with my knee. Okay, fine. I'll come in. You want to see my knees healthy? Fine. So I went to camp and I thought I had a good camp. I actually had my kids registered in school. I had a house lined up to rent. That's how sure I was after our conversations that I was going to be there. And uh, the last day of training camp was a Sunday. My agent calls and he says, just got off the phone with Vancouver and they're not going to sign you. I said, what? Like I was honestly, I was totally blindsided and I couldn't believe it. So I said, well, they got at least, tell, have them call me out of respect and tell me why. So, um, I ended up, Gillis never called me. Lawrence Gilman never called me. I did speak to, geez, they'll come to me here. Anyways, they said, listen, Mo, we just figured that we wanted to go a bit younger. Lauren? Lauren Henning, correct. Absolutely. And who I liked a lot. Yeah. Lauren called me, said, Mo, you know, I, I feel bad. But, you know, at the end of the day, we, we decided to go a little bit younger and a little bit bigger. I'm like, Lauren, you guys knew coming into camp, I wasn't going to grow and I wasn't getting any younger. 
So I'm like, <laughs> yeah. you knew what I could. Anyways, so that petered out. I was, I was, I was pissed off. To be honest with you, I, I knew the yeah. team mm-hmm. had a legit chance to win. I, I felt strongly I could be a complimentary piece. I could be used up and down the lineup, and I would accept it. it was at that stage, but anyways, that's that's over with. But um, during training camp, I got a call from the Flames. They said, "Listen, we don't know what's going on there." Uh, Daryl called and said, "Listen, if he doesn't sign in Vancouver, we'll sign him." So I ended up Sunday Vancouver, afternoon. Vancouver told me they weren't signing me. Sunday night, I signed in Calgary, and that created a new chapter in Brendan yeah. Morrison's life, including one in front of the cameras competing. Still, <laughs> I'll leave it to you because you're the fisherman. In fact, your son is an even bigger a fisherman. And well, yeah. Like, where do you call home? Are you still calling home Calgary? Well, I'm still here in Calgary. We got, uh, yeah. I, I tell people we didn't choose Calgary. Calgary chose us. Go Four kids in school for three years right. when I was yes. retired. So that, but we like it. Like, it's a good place to raise kids. We still get back to BC a lot. But and yeah. There's freshwater fishing there. There's there's freshwater fishing there, but we know you do like to, to go for the bigger game sometimes and, and get out back onto the seas. You've got the show Real West Coast, double E on the reel. And yeah. for... Guys like my son who know you as the fisherman. Oh, yeah, I think he played in the NHL versus the other way around. Uh, that you, will still never be right by me. You've got a, you've got a <laughs> reputation. You have you've carved out carved out a legit second career. So like how much fun do you have in doing this? And, and can you believe that you're, you're sort of made a, a, you know, made a second career here? No, like, you know what? I love it. Like when I get on the boat or anytime I catch a fish, whether it's on a river or lake or the ocean, I'm still like a little kid. I. You get a ton of adrenaline, a ton of excitement. And I always say, if I ever lose that, then it's time to put the rod away. But yeah, you know, I, I, I co-hosted a show for a couple of years, but I had a vision on how I wanted to do a show. So I just basically started my own show. And we wanted to sh- kind of showcase the adventure of fishing, not just catching, reeling fish in, but you know, taking in your surroundings, talking a little bit about conservation, culture. And it's been tremendous. Like I've got to go to so many phenomenal places across british columbia we've been up to alaska we've been to hawaii we've been to mexico we've been down to belize and chasing all these different species of fish and interacting with great people whether guides or guests and uh yeah it, it's been a lot of fun and it's been a, a big success like we we got a great following i you know i think we our fishing show has the largest reach of any fishing show on the west coast you know we we air on check tv wild tv we're on amazon prime down in the u.s uh all the social media outlets. We have our Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, our webpage. So yeah, it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. So I kind of handle, I deal with all the, uh, you know, our sponsors, contracts, you know, kind of locations of fishing. I have uh, one employee, Mike, Mike Bemister, a great guy, handles all our, our, our camera work, our production stuff, social media. So we're, we're a good team. We're, we're lean, we're small, but we, we love it. Gosh, Blake, sounds familiar. Yeah, you yeah. should run all our distribution yeah, exactly. doing it years before we started this up. Okay, here's the big question then, Brendan. Who's the better fisherman? You or Willie? <laughs> I knew that was going to come. <laughs> you know, of course, oh, right? Man. I got to give Willie props. He's, he is a good fisherman and he's been doing it longer than I have. He, uh, he's been fishing out at Port McNeil, you know, since he was a kid with his dad. So he's been fishing longer than I have. You know, he, oh man. It depends what day it is. It depends what day it is. Yeah. Some, day, some right. days Willie has a good day, but I uh, know he mm-hmm. he's good, man. He, he spends a lot of time at it. He's passionate. It's uh, and, and I love it too. We have a good time together. And the two of you involved in the place up in the outfit in out of Stefino, or is that just him now? So Willie's in that along with Dan Hamhoos and another partner, Andrew Purdy. I never got involved in it, although I do keep my boat there, and I appreciate what those guys do. They're doing they're doing an awesome <laughs> job. <laughs> <laughs> We had Hammer on uh, for our Family Day episode a couple of oh, months, nice. uh, months back. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Brendan, marvelous stuff here today. You were always a classy and great player for the Vancouver Canucks. You're even better as a person. We very much appreciate the time. Thank you for this. We wish you all the best. I was going to say fairways and greens, but I guess you know, <laughs> no, no, whatever the fishing equivalent. You yeah. can just say uh, uh, th- tight lines. Keep your rod up. Tight lines. <laughs> there, there you go. go. There you go. Thanks for thanks for this, my man. All the best. Appreciate it, fellas. Uh, yeah, you guys are doing a good job. They're always nice to connect and, and kind of reminisce a bit. So thank you. Thanks for having me. Jaguar Land Rover Vancouver is on the move, folks. Come October 2022. The 
Fable Jaguar Land Rover location at the corner of Burrard and First. We're moving up a few blocks to Burrard and Fourth. Same great service, same great sales personnel, and of course, the same great amazing vehicle lines from both Jaguar and Land Rover. They can't wait to show you the expansive new digs with uh, a massive certified pre owned showroom as well. It's all at jaguarvancouver.ca, landrovervancouver.ca. I live in that hood. It is quite a structure yes. uh, going up, and they're going to be unmistakable on a very, very busy corner. Hope you got out and played some golf this weekend, and if you did, I hope it was at the Whistler Golf Club if you were lucky enough. The Arnold Palmer Design Whistler Golf Club. If you're frustrated by those 7- or 30-day booking restrictions at local clubs, go ahead and book it for any time during the 2022 season at the Whistler Golf Club. And, of course, if you've got that group of 12 or more, first of all, you better hurry because those weekend primetime slots are really filling up. But if you've got that group, you, the organizer, plays for free. Go to whistlergolf.com slash groups with whistlergolf.com. We always knew him as a great storyteller, but, wow, uh, just check off the list there. How about... WHL coaches and owners waiting in the parking lot to try and recruit you Unbelievable. from the Penticton Panthers. Uh, I I heard the story um, that he was on the ice for the original Michigan goal, but how about the backstory there? You know, Red Berenson looked like the old crotchety hockey guy, but telling uh, Leg, no, go ahead, try that in a game one day. And then the exuberance of his teammates when he pulls it off in a big spot in an elimination game, right? And and what he talked about was the space that Mike Leg had at the time. And this is how the lacrosse move, the leg move, is now uh, changing the game. When somebody's parked back there in Gretzky's office, right? Now defensemen have to guard against that shot, and that sucks guys, defenders down low, opening up space Absolutely. in the slot. It's it's a good thing for the game to have that Absolutely. as a threat. Yeah, they got to respect it. Yeah. Crazy that it took a quarter century, though, huh? Before it That's started getting, thing. like, nobody was talking about the lacrosse goal. such a snail space. At two th- like, let's say 2005, no one was talking about the lacrosse goal, and it was 10 years old no. at that point. It took that long. No, uh, Bobby Mack, the Bob father, nailing his draft position. Had him 39th, got drafted 39th. You should joke with Bobby about that. Next time I see Bobby, we say absolutely spot on. This probably happened a few times in his career, I'm going to guess. I'm still trying to put the visual in my mind of Jean Beliveau and Alexander Dagg by horse and carriage to the (laughs) Colisee for the draft in (laughs) Quebec City. And then how about the first meeting with Willie Mitchell? Oh, he's going to crash on our couch here. Who's this guy? Yeah, who is this guy? The two go angling from there on in. Yeah, private jet setting with Lou Lamorello. And, oh, uh, I, I got awkward <laughs> hearing that story. Imagine an hour on a plane, hour and a half on the plane with Lou just staring at you. Oh my goodness. Yeah, uh, knew the Minnesota Wild series in 03, uh would still hurt. I can remember him being upset about not making the Canucks the one year on the PTO, but uh, wow, it would have been marvelous to have him as a, a part of that group. It really uh, sounded really, like he wanted it, yeah, huh? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, um, that team, those teams had a lot, had a lot, they had a lot going for it, but sure. to have a local hero who connected with the Canucks pass like that would have been absolutely marvelous. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this special SNP present.